Hey everybody, welcome to the New Market Alliance Church podcast, where you're invited to not just attend church or watch church, or in this case, listen to church, but actually go and be the church. For everything you need to know about our community, be sure to go to newmarketalliance.ca and maybe even drop us a line to let us know you're listening. We read everything you send and we'll be sure to get back to you. Our worship service happens every Sunday at 10 a.m. in person or streaming online. We want you to know you absolutely matter to God and you absolutely matter to us. Everyone is welcome and wanted. Now, let's join today's teaching. The Olympics are happening shortly. I have mixed feelings about it. Normally I'd be all in, but there's no Connor McDavid there. There's no NHL players there. It's in China. I still have, you know, some some residual anger over the Michael and Michael uh, captivity. I'm not sure I want to celebrate uh, the Chinese government right now. But every four years, you know, my mom, who's never like uh, watched a sp- sporting event in her life, all of a sudden becomes like. Miss Olympia, and she can be brought to tears by couples skating, and uh, she's all in on on Olympics. Uh, I don't know. Maybe write in the comments your favorite uh, Olympic Winter Olympic sport. Please don't write down the one where you cross country ski and then shoot at things, because why? Why do that? Unless you're shooting at each other, and that like the feels like a real sport. Then, um, turns out that not all medals are created equal. Uh, maybe that's obvious, but USA Today cited this report, and they actually measured the happiness level of of Olympic winners and the contentment level of gold, silver, bronze winners. Happiest people. Da-da. It's the, the gold medal, medal winners. That, that's probably no surprise. The second happiest people, this may surprise you. Uh, it would stand to reason that the silver medal would be the next happiest athlete. They were not. It was the bronze medalists who were happier than the silver medalists. Why is that, do you think? Uh, maybe you've sussed out the rationale. Uh, Silver medalists think, I came this close to winning the gold. Whereas the bronze medalist thinks, I I almost didn't get any medal. (laughs) I'm just grateful to be on the podium. Um, You know, one reflects on what they have. The other laments on what they don't have. And, and psychologists have a term for this. They call it uh, counterfactual thinking. Uh, it's the I could have, should have state of mind. Now, I'm going to propose a theory here, an observation really, that we as Western Christians can have this tendency to suffer from the silver medal syndrome. Okay, even though we have the highest standard of living in recorded history, uh, we never quite seem to have enough. I I read quite a bit. Um, I have this blind spot to fiction, though. Ninety five percent of what I read is is nonfiction. Uh, Don't read a lot of novels, but I think my favorite book is this novel, uh, Catch-22, by Joseph Heller. It's one of the few books I can recall, like, laughing just outright uh, as I read it. Well, there's this story about Joseph Heller. Uh, He's at this party full of of elites, influencer types, and uh, it's thrown by this billionaire hedge fund manager. And author Kurt Vonnegut is there, and he leans over to his pal, Joseph Heller, and sort of needles him a bit by saying, you realize this hedge fund manager guy has made more money in a single day than you've earned in a lifetime from selling your wildly popular novel. And apparently, this is how Joseph Heller responded, and I think it's profound, and this is what he said. Yeah, 
but I have something that he'll never have. Enough. (laughs) I have something that he'll never have. Enough. And we have this tendency to compare to others, especially those in a tax bracket above us. And then we get surprised that we don't feel content. Uh, This feeling that we don't have enough. And our culture keeps working hard to sustain that feeling in us, doesn't it? Advertising is based on this principle entirely. Did you know that if you own a car today, and I'm talking any kind of car at all, you're in the company of just 18% of the whole world. So more than four to five people don't own a car. Just 10 years ago, it was closer to 8% of people. 1.1 billion people don't have access to clean drinking water. Go turn on your tap right now when I'm done talking. Some experts say to completely solve global hunger, it would cost about $30 billion a year. Uh, Americans spend more than that on pizza every year. You, you remember the Sermon on the Mount series uh, a few months ago, and, and Jesus said this, and it was so uh, beautifully covered, so articulately by Rachel West. But here's what Jesus said. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. You know, the great temptation in our culture is to run after the same things that everybody else does. Uh, Rather than trusting God to supply our needs, we get caught up in this frenzy of accumulation. You know, like a person in a crowd at Black Friday, um, God kind of gets pushed to the side. And here's what mentor Paul said to his mentee, young leader, Timothy. He said, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And then he he went on to command the rich to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Don't you love that phrase? Take hold of the life that is truly life. Dang, that'll, that'll preach. Because the world says there is a unique correlation between what we do with our money and the quality of life that we experience. And, and we're bullied into believing that, that life in all its fullness is to be found in an abundance of possessions and wealth. Jesus and Paul says that there's something way greater, more fulfilling, more profound, something eternal at stake here. You know, my man, Tim Keller from uh, New York, he keeps saying such smart things. So smart, I have to like read them three times to really get it. And, and here's what he said. Money flows effortlessly to that which is its God. Let me take a minute to sink in. Let me read it again. Money flows effortlessly to that which is its God. Okay, I imagine that I said this to you. Imagine I said, okay, I want all y'all to set aside 10% of your income each month for the purpose of taking a luxury trip to Europe this year. What's your emotional response to that. Or let's say I said, I want you all to set aside 10% of your income each month to upgrade all the technology in your life, get all the latest versions. What does that stir in you? What's your emotional response? 
Uh, what if I said, I want you to set aside 10% of your income this month to upgrade your wardrobe? You can spend all you have on two major sales this year. What's your emotional response to that? Now tell me your response to the following. Let's say I said, I want you to set aside 10% of your income each month to help the unemployed at our church. I want you to set aside 10% of your income to give to the homeless shelter. Uh, I want you to set aside 10% of your income each month to help pay off the debts of the people in your small group. If, if we're being honest, for a lot of us, it would be safe to say that we're doing pretty good in our race with the world. Uh, most of our attention and affection and energy are, are flowing towards the same things as the world. And I, I realize the uphill battle in this, the culture is working against the principles of Jesus on this. There's this thing called uh, planned obsolescence. You heard of this? They don't make things like they, do, they used to. Well, you're right. And that's part of the plan. Uh, we have these perfectly good iPads at the church. And uh, they're old enough, though, now that they, they won't update or download the latest apps. Uh, Apple wants us to buy new ones. What about this thing, perceived obsolescence? This is more about fashions and trends. This is all about this fear of being out of step, uh, left behind kind of culturally. Styles change, technology evolving. We don't want to miss out. I'm not immune to this, but I've gotten old enough and hoarded enough of my clothes that I find it interesting that if, if I wait long enough, a lot of my wardrobe actually comes back into fashion. So our cultural rhythm is something like this. Work, watch, spend, repeat. Work, watch, spend, repeat. Work longer hours, move up the ladder, ladder to get more money. Watch, TikTok, Netflix, Instagram, get all that inadvertent advertising coming at you so you can have your dissatisfaction fed. Spend, do it instantly from home now. Don't you love how it can show up at your door the next day? All the friction has been removed. Like notice on Amazon Prime it has this buy now button. Boo! You wake up the next day and there's a package on your front door. Oh, don't you love that? And, and there's no friction. And then repeat, repeat, repeat. How do we break free of this cycle? How do we push back against the tide of an entire culture? What does it look like to take hold of the life that is truly life? Jesus actually proposed some fairly radical solutions. It starts with generosity. It's the first thing to do in breaking this cycle of the culture. Now, that may seem intuitive. It ain't easy. Uh, partly because even our generosity can be co-opted by the culture, by bad intentions, by quite frankly, our own sin nature, our own selfishness. Whenever somebody offers a gift to you, it's almost impossible, it seems, to receive it freely. Did I get them a gift? Do I have to add them to my Christmas gift list now? Are they part of the recipients? They have one up on me. Uh, we can feel that we're now in their debt. You know, uh, even a simple dinner invitation. You ever notice this? If someone has you over for dinner, every time you see that person, there might be this feeling now of like an obligation to invite them back to even up the scales somehow. You see this everywhere in big and small ways. You see it in nonprofits uh, named after celebrities, hospital wings named after generous donors. People seem to expect some sort of return on their generosity. 
And I, I've seen people in churches withhold their giving, their tithes, because they didn't like a decision from the leadership as though they were some sort of shareholder in a business, as though you know, they were giving money to people instead of God, and with some sort of expectation that their giving equaled influence or access. You know, as a young uh, pastor, youth pastor, I had somebody remind me that youth don't actually give to the overall budget of the church. So you need to remember which side my bread was buttered on. I wish 49-year-old Jonathan could go back and have that conversation again instead of 27-year-old Jonathan. Because I think at the time I was confused trying to figure out what did baked goods and butter have to do with anything? Again, the Sermon on the Mount lays it out. Jesus says, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When we give in secret, there is um, a cycle that is broken of obligation that is so present in our giving and our relationships. Have you ever had someone anonymously give you money? I have. It's an interesting experience. Everything in us wants to know who gave it so that we can thank them and honor them and maybe even you know, put it in the old memory bank so that one day you can pay them back. Left without someone to thank, all we can do is look to God and, and rejoice and humbly learn to receive it. You know, I had the unique privilege of seeing this play out on both sides of the equation. Someone not that long ago at Nat gave me $500 in cash because they felt there was somebody who needed it or was going to need it. And so I got to be the messenger and I waited until it seemed like the right receiver had come along. And, uh, and I think the receiver expressed that same feeling that I had of gratitude mixed with, I don't know, unworthiness, loss of words. How do I respond? Have you ever given to someone in secret? I think it does something good for your soul. There, there's a battle inside of us to want to identify ourselves, but man, giving in secret can just liberate you from that affirmation. Um, you know, instead to just receive the affirmation of your father who sees what is done in secret. I, I think this applies to other things as well. You know, other ways that we can be generous. I, I remember somebody said to me, you know, I, I just wanted to let you know, Jonathan, that um, I've forgiven you. You, you. you hurt me a while back, and, I, and I've forgiven you. And uh, I was like, well, oh, should we, like, do you want to tell me about that? Or what, how can I, I, I don't even know what you mean. No, 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 just, just know that I've forgiven you. That sort of defeats the purpose of the whole interaction there. Um, to do it anonymous, to do it in your heart uh, is maybe more the spirit of, of that kind of generosity. But here's something Jesus does that if we really got a hold of, it would, I think it would liberate our hearts. You know, because of the resurrection, because Jesus has defeated death and the grave, we have the gift of eternal life the joy of living with Jesus forever. Well, what does that have to do with money and generosity? Well, if you have a predominantly uh, consideration that, that, that money applies just to this life, you know, I think you're in danger of having what I'd call a scarcity mentality. 
The idea that my limited resources must be spent in my lifetime or I'm not getting the best out of life. Actually, the scriptures tell us the opposite. God has unlimited riches in Christ Jesus and we have an internal inheritance kept for us in heaven. If we, if we truly understood that, we'd be freed to be incredibly generous with our short lives here on earth. You know, months after the resurrection, um, I think that epiphany must have been realized by the early church because here's what was said about them in Acts. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work on them that there was no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Jesus' resurrection changes everything. And one of the first places it manifests itself is in generosity. I, I think of the people at NAC, a small group pays for the corrective dental surgery of someone who could never afford it. Um, I think of someone who donates thousands of dollars worth of tech equipment to the church. I know someone who invested money and the whole intention that whatever it yielded, it would be given to the work that, that Pastor Nathan is doing in the Longford area. And no surprise to me, it actually, in, the investment yielded more than they even predicted. I, I think of the people, some young adults actually, who covered the entire cost of a serve our city meal for a whole night. Uh, sometimes I get to hear these stories because of the role I'm in, but there's a ton that I don't know about. Maybe stories that you have been directly impacted by, been the beneficiary of. Listen to how the apostle John puts it. He says, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. This is how we know what love is, that Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. The resurrection of Jesus didn't happen so we could have this, you know, private theology, a private faith, uh, just a personal expression of worship and gratitude. The abundance found in Christ and his promises to us frees us up to love others, to, to build his church, to respond to people in the same way that Jesus did, sacrificially, generously. The third thing Jesus does to break us out of this cycle of consumption and scarcity is he actually can transform our hearts. I, I have been slow to talk about money at NAC. In, you know, in my four years here, um, I've never done a generosity series. It, it only came up in one sermon uh, when we talked about parables. And uh, I, I taught about the the man who built bigger barns. And, you know, of course, we mentioned the five ways that you can give almost every week, but not in a teaching context. And I, I guess there's been a couple reasons that I have been slow to do that. Number one, in terms of money management, in terms of wise investment, good budgeting, I, I'm just not equipped to teach that. There's an old school mentality uh, or perception that pastors ought to be qualified to be experts on all aspects of life. Maybe it's pastors who perpetuated that myth. It just ain't true. 
Uh, there are people in our congregation who are really good with the mechanics of stewardship, of helping you get out of debt, of living within your means. If you, if you need assistance in that, we can help. I can't help, but I know people who can help you. And uh, I'm not reckless or anything. It's just not uh, a strength. Number two, I guess I've shied away partly from this topic because generosity, honestly, is not one of my personal spiritual gift strengths. Um, I'm obedient in this area, but some people, people I could name from NAC, are more qualified to speak on it because it comes out of a passion, out of a spiritual gifting. Now, that shouldn't stop me from preaching a truth. If I stopped preaching on every topic <laughs> that I wasn't good at, it would be a very short list of topics that I could preach on. Um, especially, are you ready for this? Because Jesus spoke on this topic almost more than any other, more than heaven, more than on the church, more than on salvation or missions. But the big reason, and it gives me pause on talking about generosity and money, is frankly because of the perception. This, and some of it has been earned, this idea that the church only wants your money. I, I guarantee there are people watching right now, people in your life right now, who think that the church, maybe even this church, is only interested in your money. And, uh, and now maybe they have their worst suspicions confirmed as I talk about this. But let me say, at the end of today, I'm not going to ask you for more money. All things considered, NAC is actually in a pretty good shape financially. I'm not asking for more funds today. I'm challenging us for more faith. I'm not fundraising today. I'm faith raising. Because if scarcity is the cancer, generosity is the cure. I believe that. Generosity is not even something we want from you. It's really something we want for you. Generosity is an attribute of Jesus. Uh, in faith today, I want to be more like Jesus. I want you to be more like Jesus. I'll tell you something else. Jesus never used guilt as a motivator. Guilt is such a uh, a limited technique in affecting real change. Giving under guilt, it just can't sustain generosity. Uh, guilt doesn't change us into generous people. It only asks the question, you know, how much do I have to give so that I won't feel guilty anymore? <laughs> Rather than motivating by guilt, God's heart is that we would be compelled by love. Um, scripture says that if I give all I possess to the poor, but do not have love, I, I got nothing. And our response to the needs of the world around us is based on what God has done for us in Christ. That's giving out of grace. Uh, that is giving out of um, an ongoing stewardship and investment of our time of our heart, of our resources, all on the behalf of others. You know, living in Canada is, is, is actually a spiritually dangerous place to be, I think. A society where the norm is to consume and hoard and accumulate and look out for number one. You know, the tragedy of Canada and the States and the so-called Western nations is not our financial abundance, but our spiritual poverty. Jesus wants to save us from giving our lives to something that doesn't matter. Tomorrow we're going to celebrate the life of this beautiful Saint Peggy. And I just think of her legacy, how she gave her life to things that matter. You know, in a culture that re relentlessly reminds us of what we don't have, the silver medal syndrome, 
Jesus reminds us not to put our hope in wealth, but to put our hope in God, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous, to be willing to share. And in doing so, you will take hold of the life that is truly life. The world is watching, folks. They're wondering if God is really generous. They're wondering if the people who call themselves followers really are generous. There was this dude, <laughs> Aristides. Craig probably will correct me on my pronunciation, our history major. He was a second century Greek philosopher. And he shared with Caesar Hadrian what he observed about the first century Christian church. Here's what he, here's what he says. They love one another. And he who has gives to him who has not, without boasting. And when they see a stranger, they take him into their own homes and rejoice over him as a very brother. And if there is among them any that is poor and needy, and if they have no spare food, they fast two or three days in order to supply to the needy their lack of food. Such, O king, is their manner of life. And verily, this is a new people. And there is something divine in the midst of them. May Christ be our gain and may we take hold of the life that is truly life. Generosity, when it flows naturally from the heart of a church community, man, it is contagious, really. It has an undeniable effect on people who come into contact with it. It expresses in practical in powerful ways, the gospel, the core of our faith, that God gave his only son, that we might have life. Generous churches believe that they have been given everything and as an expression of their love for God, they share what they have with others, people who are in need. You know, money might be the most measurable aspect of our faith. How we spend our money reflects our commitment, uh, whether we practice what we say we believe or not. You know, when our funds flow out, people flow in. It's true. There is an attractional power to no strings attached generosity. Would a city like Newmarket sees a church freely giving of its time, of its talent, of its treasure. People are magnetically drawn towards that.